I'm Margaret Gam, Director of Special Collections and Archives at the University of Iowa Libraries. And again, thank you for joining us today. First off, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Iowa is located on the historical homelands of over 15 tribal nations. The Omaha Tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska, Meskwaki, and Hillchunk nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa, and we continue to acknowledge them. To help you start your own exploration of these histories of Iowa and its people, we encourage you to take a look at the links provided in the Zoom chat or in the YouTube video description. So tonight's speakers join us from Grinnell College, uh, the lucky recipient of the Salisbury House Library in 2019. Laura Michelson is the project archivist working with the Salisbury House Library Collection at Grinnell College Special Collections. Her project term began in August 2020, um, auspicious timing, <laughs> and is through the 2023-2024 year, or yes, 2024 year. This academic term, they are also serving as an interim humanities consulting librarian. Laura's research interests include critical librarianship and library history, particularly gentlemen's libraries of the 1920s and Iowa book culture. Laura earned a BA in Medieval Early Modern Studies from Cornell College and a field trip to our very own UI Special Collections and UICB sparked her interest in the field um, where I was very happy to work with her as our Olson graduate assistant. Chris Jones is Special Collections Librarian and Archivist of the College at Grinnell College. He earned a bachelor's degree in French from the University of Northern Iowa and a master's degree in library and information science from UIUC. <clears throat> Prior to his current position, Chris worked as a library assistant in special collections at Cornell, amongst other positions. Chris's research interests include the history of the book, the history of readership, the history of lyceums in the Midwest, and creating opportunities for undergraduate students to gain transferable skills. Thank you for joining us today, Laura and Chris, and I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Margaret. Um, and I will get our um, presentation shared. All right, can you see slides? Okay, awesome. Um, and I will start us off um, as we are speaking to you today from Grinnell um, with the Grinnell College Land Acknowledgement. Grinnell College acknowledges that we are on the ancestral territory of the Meskwaki, Sauk, and Iowa peoples, whose land was taken from them through the encroachment of white settlers, and then formally in 1845 through government land concessions. We wish to pay respect to the Meskwaki, Sauk, and Iowa elders, both past and present, and to recognize the Meskwaki Nation that exists today in Tama County, less than 30 miles from Grinnell College. Um, this image comes from nativeland.canada, um, which is an excellent site along with um, the resources that the University of Iowa folks shared with you. Um, and to get us started, I will pass it off to Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, so I am going to give uh, a brief history of the house and say a few words about Carl and Edith Weeks, who are responsible for the home and the collections. And uh, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the history of the collection um, up to the arrival of Laura on our campus. So to get started, uh, Salisbury House, um, for those who may not be familiar, is a house museum in Des Moines, um, built by, by the Weeks's, Carl and Edith, uh, about whom I'll say more in a minute. Um, some of the most notable features about Salisbury House include uh, its large collection of art, including paintings, sculptures, and, and uh, tapestries. It has uh, a collection of medieval weapons and armors. Some are uh, repli replications, but some are, uh, are the genuine article. Um, and a, a large family library, which is now here at Grinnell College. Um, it also hosts a variety of architectural features that were uh, reclaimed during um, construction done in London in the early 1900s. Um, and I'll say more on that in a second. Edith and Carl Weeks were both native Iowans. Um, Edith was born in Dubuque 
on August 2nd, 1882. And Carl was born in rural Lynn County in, on December 2nd, 1876. Um, Carl was born into a family that consisted of several pharmacists, uh, including two of his brothers. He graduated in 1892 from Highland Park College uh, in Des Moines, um, having studied pharmacy. And in 1902, Carl and his brother Leo joined a third brother, Dayet, uh, in the family drug company, and they worked together until 1908 when Dayet passed away. At that point, Carl and uh, Leo formed their own, their own company. Um, in, beginning in 1905, or 1915 rather, Carl struck out on his own and formed the Armand Company. And one of Carl's innovations in his professional life was combining cold cream and face powder developing a foundation. With the popularity of the company and especially the news com new cosmetic line, came new wealth and the Weekses decide, decided to build a home inspired by the King's House, which they had encountered during a 1921 visit to Salisbury, England. Construction on the house began in 1923 and the Weekses moved in in 1925, even though construction um, really wasn't complete until 1928. Most of the materials uh, of the architectural materials were shipped to the Weekses from England um, and were reclaimed, as I said earlier, from actually a very small neighborhood in, in uh, London, including some of these, uh, some of these features included uh, various ceiling beams, wooden wall panels, and a rat. Um, there really is a rat, and uh, the Weekses at one point had said to their proxy operating in London that uh, after seeing photographs of a room that they just fell in love with it and they wanted everything in the room. And it turns out the foreman had quite a little sense of humor. Uh, and so as they were dismantling the walls, they found a desiccated rat inside and they, they boxed up the rat and sent it to the Weekses. And you can actually see the rat now. It is in a glass case and is on display in the library uh, library room in Salisbury House. So the Weeks's family grew and eventually became, or they well, eventually welcomed uh, four boys into the family. Um, and and as time passed, Edith passed away in 1955, and Carl in 1962. Both were very supportive of ed education, uh, at one time bequeathing their estate to Drake University. Um, and Carl even served on their on Drake's Board of Trustees for a time. So they were they were both very supportive of reading and, and of education. So a little bit about the collection history and its arrival at Grinnell. In November of 2018, the Grinnell College Libraries were approached by the Board of Salisbury House to gauge interest in purchasing the library collection. Uh, we worked with Kit Kern and Jamie Nicolette um, as representatives of the house. And um, after a couple of exploratory conversations and a look at an, an inventory, a spreadsheet, our library director, Mark Crystal, our then cataloging and metadata librarian, Cecilia Knight, uh, then Special Collections Librarian Catherine Rod and I all visited Salisbury House and got to see the collection firsthand. I have to admit, when we got there, I, having never been part of, of such a negotiation situation before, I, I asked how we were going to play this, and we decided to kind of keep our cards close to our best. And um, I did really well for about five minutes. And then it just got overwhelming. It was way too awesome. And um, it was a lot like being a kid in a candy store. Um, so I'm glad it worked out because I might've blown that. Um, anyway, as, as negotiations continued, uh, we on our side of things lined up someone to evaluate the collection. And as negotiations were finalized and news broke of the purchase, um, 
I spoke to the, I was invited to speak to the Lions Club and also did a real brief radio spot here in Grinnell talking about the collection. Before the collection could arrive, we had to uh, do, make some changes. Um, we had to tear out a little over half of the shelving in our vault to install compact shelving. And that, that increased our uh, storage capacity by about 33% which we immediately filled. Um, and the collection finally arrived at Grinnell the first week of August. So the first truckload uh, of books arrived the morning of August 6, 2019. And there were a total of um, five or six, I don't recall off the top of my head, five or six truckloads of books over a two day period. We did decide to merge some archival and library philosophies and keep the collection in original order and continue to track um, and associate the Salisbury House inventory numbers with uh, the sh shelf marks and the books so that moving forward, we can keep all of that information associated um, via metadata. This was complicated because uh, during each ownership period of the collection, um, books tended to move. As I mean, as book lovers, you all know, um, it's pretty common to pick up a book on this shelf and put it down on that shelf, and uh, you kind of forget where you you found something, and so you just put it where it fits. So true original order was not uh, not really kept. Um, throughout its the collection's history, but we did freeze it in the order in which we found it um, on our first visit. And by looking at the shelves, you can see still see pockets of themes when browsing the shelves. So there are pockets of limited editions club books, for example, and there are pockets of American Southwest related material and Bibles and pockets of books about books. So shelf reading, it still gives you an interest or a still gives you a, a sense of the various interests of, of Carl and Edith and, and how they chose to grow out their collection. So after the collection arrived, uh, and this is, is not necessarily in chronological order, um, but there was a huge flurry of activity. And so one of the biggest events was an enormous open house that we held in three rooms on the lower level of Berlin Library here. Um, that was on February 6, 2020, about a month and a half before the college sent everyone home for uh, the rest of the academic year and the following year, actually, because of COVID. We were expecting about, um, about 80 people or so, and we wound up with somewhere between 140 and 150 people. Uh, so it was, it was an enormous turnout for for a library held event. We were really excited about that. Um, in fact, there were so many people that we actually had some folks express disappointment that they couldn't see everything. And uh, they shared hopes that we would um, continue to hold more public events so that they could come back and, and see and learn and interact with the material. So that was, it was a big coup for us. Uh, we banned, we, began almost immediately incorporating a few pieces of the collection into classes, um, mostly our book history related uh, sessions. Um, we also began having one-on-one -on -one or, or sometimes two or three-on-one -on -one discussions with faculty who were curious about how they could ex access the, the collection um, for, for their own teaching, for their own research, um, uh, especially because we'd, we'd done some work ahead of time to drum up interest. So they, they'd heard of the collection by that point and were curious. Uh, I met with the Lions Club a second time to talk about the collection and be able to speak in more concrete, concrete terms about it, how it would be used, uh, how, how the public could access it, um, and to invite them to the open house. As a part of the agreement with Salisbury House, we purchased a new display case uh, for them to highlight pieces from the library. So uh, we spent some time um, we spent some time shopping for cases and developing a, a 
a loan agreement with an outside party, which is something that we had never done before. We met with colleagues in the Office of Corporate Foundation and Government Relations. We frequently just say grants office because it's shorter. Um, to discuss possible funding sources for projects related to the Salisbury House Library Collection. And Mark and I kind of went on a local speaking circuit. Uh, he and I met with trustees to introduce the collection, highlights, how we'd begun using it right away, et cetera. And then within a week or two, we gave an almost identical talk to the Executive Council of Administrators on campus. Um, and shortly thereafter, we, we gave a similar spiel to the lifetime and retired trustees. Um, so there was a lot of a lot of uh, um, a lot of PR, I guess. And then we also almost immediately held an English department lit lunch. So not just faculty, but students were also uh, interested in hearing more about this collection that, that was landing at Grinnell. And then in uh, early Mayish, we posted a project archivist position, hoping for a quick turnaround and all the stars and all the planets aligned. And we were so very fortunate when uh, Laura was able to join us in August. And so I will, I will turn it over to Laura. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Chris, for that introduction. Um, and I will say, if you've never been to Salisbury House, um, we would highly recommend you go take a tour with our friends there. Um, you will not uh, be sorry that you did. Um, so uh, I'll pick up kind of where Chris has left off. Um, the stars aligned on my end as well. Um, I was just graduating in May of 2020 from University of Iowa um, and completing my Olson Fellowship in Special Collections. Um, when this job came on the market. Um, and after focusing on the Brewer Lee Hunt collection at Iowa, I fell into working with yet another 1920s era Iowa Gentlemen's Library. Um, so my term as project archivist began in August of 2020. It was still the early months of the COVID pandemic and Grinnell's campus was operating largely remotely and in the library, staff was staggering time in the building and working from home. During my first regular Monday morning special collections meeting on August 10th, 2020, a derecho blew through Iowa. The storm left millions across the state without power and irreparable damage. On campus, the most extensive damage was in loss of trees, one of which came down on the front steps of my rental house. Um, campus was paused for a week as repairs and power could be restored, but luckily the library had little damage and through monitoring the environmental controls in the vault, um, the collection fared well and it did not experience any drastic changes in temperature or humidity. Um, throughout my first term here, uh, my first term year here at Grinnell, campus, as Chris mentioned, had kind of adapted because of the pandemic and was operating on the quarter system. So we had limited residential occupancy. My first experience working with a Grinnell class was a virtual tour of the vault with the help of a book truck and an extra webcam. So staggering time on site, I was in the building about two days a week um, and remote the rest of the time, um, getting to know the digital side of the collection, drafting work plans and kind of scaffolding for future projects. Although most of my first year getting to know Grinnell was through a webcam or behind a mask, the Grinnellian spirit of inquiry and curiosity made it abundantly clear how well suited this campus is for a collection of this caliber that is primed for research and learning. So my term as project archivist has been very varied in the best way possible. Um, but to keep things in focus for our time tonight, I'd like to highlight the story so far of this collection and my experience through getting to know the collection, instruction, partnership, interpretation, and collection care. So getting to know the collection. Um, at home now at Grinnell College's campus, if you've never visited us before, Special Collections and Archives is housed in the lower level of Burling Library. So you walk through another wood-lined reading room, um, and the collection is at home in a climate-controlled book vault, where it spans three full lengths of rolling carriage shelves that Chris was showing you. 
totaling about 87 linear feet on the shelves. The collection is about 5,000 items, which is nearly 3,500 individual titles and 1,500 manuscript items. The collection was moved and is being maintained, as Chris was mentioning, in original order. So although we are a closed stacked archive, preserving this for posterity keeps alive a connection with how the books were used and accessed at Salisbury House for decades. And it may be an avenue for future researchers to interpret and experience the collection. To maintain this order, um, we are assigning a collection number uh, that corresponds to the shelf location, and we, it's also super important that whenever something is leaving the shelf, we have it well documented where it's going and when it will be back. The scope of the collection varies as it ranges from the 12th century to contemporary 1960s literature, including medieval manuscripts and modernists. There's a large run of limited editions club fine copies, which are a favorite with our students. The week's family membership number was 589. So if you ever find a limited editions club book and it has number 589 in the back, we'd probably like to know about it. Um, they also have a number of um, copies from famous authors some of which uh, include Walt Whitman. We have about 18 copies of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, spanning from a first edition from 1855 to an artist edition in 1944. Through the collection, we get a snapshot of the week's family interests, including the American West, which they visited frequently, um, antiques, furnishings, English architecture, and gardens that nod to their setting and style of their estate that they built in Des Moines, and a section on art and artists and on book collection speak to their interest in collecting and also a snapshot of the markets that they were purchasing at in the 1920s and 1930s. Among the historic materials are a handful of medieval manuscripts, including three illuminated books of hours that we'll take a look at in a little bit, a dozen incunabula, which are books printed in Europe pre-1501, and editions of many more classics. Contemporaries on the shelf um, as well include Ernest Hemingway, who they befriended during visits to the Florida Keys, James Joyce, Sinclair Lewis, and Henry Miller, and materials from avant-garde expat presses like the Black Sun Press in Paris. Some of the author acquaintances that the Weeks family uh, made can also be traced through inscriptions on the shelf such as the mysterious Isidore Levine, who is an author on the cusp of ethnography and anthropology, who appears to have vanished in the 1940s. Um, apparently, Carl Weeks helped finance him publishing novels, um, although little is really known about their relationship. We also have materials related to Maureen Whipple, a novelist based in Utah in the 1940s who wrote The Giant Joshua, um, and there's an extensive correspondence between her and Weeks in the collection. And there's also a connection to Ruth and John Vesos, who published in 1930 Ultimo, which is a futuristic look at life um, under the earth, uh, which is a fascinating book to page through. Um, there's an interesting inscription with this book that we really need to dig into more. There's a dedica dedicatory quote printed in all of the runs of the book from 1930. Um, that is, if you can think of space when it was apparently empty, you were there, and it is credited CW. There's an inscription in our copy of the book that suggests that that is a quote from Carl Weeks and that he was somehow involved in the creation of this book as well. Um, so a research project for someone there. The single most represented author in the collection is D.H. Lawrence, with over 150 volumes authored or contributed to by Lawrence on the shelf, and over 30 volumes about him and his works. We also have a full binder of manuscripts and correspondence from D.H. and his wife, Frida. It appears that following her husband's death, Carl and Frida struck up a friendship and a correspondence, he purchased some of the materials directly from her and would also send her Armand Cosmetics uh, products whenever she would write him a note that she was running low. 
Cataloging the collection is yet underway and it will be ongoing for some time. So a reference list and manuscript finding aid will be made live soon for browsing, but you're also welcome to reach out to us at any time. Um, we're happy to make subject lists or share um, that working document with people um, before your next visit. Um, so another big part of my position, which I really enjoyed, is bringing this collection into the classroom. With return to campus for all students in the fall of 2021 came a new opportunity for immersion of the collection into classes that were visiting the reading room. Since fall of 2021, materials from the collection have been pulled for over 25 classes and reached 300 or more students. It has been utilized so far with visiting courses from history, English, education, anthropology, German studies, classics, and art history, uh, with the possibility to support many other areas and topics. In the classroom, the collection has joined material from the college archives and the existing rare book collection here at Grinnell, and is now a part of a teaching collection. So it has been an opportunity for students studying medieval art to turn the pages of a full book of hours um, and see an illuminated manuscript up close. It's been an opportunity for students studying education and historical perspectives to see a really early Webster dictionary or an 1882 primer. Um, and for some students, handling an item from this collection is their first introduction to the world of rare books and the primary source research that's at their fingertips here at Grinnell. One of the most involved and rewarding class visits is what you see pictured here in these images um, from a class that visited in November of 2021 um, from Professor Mike Gunther's History 235, Britain in the Age of Enlightenment course. We talked to the professor uh, beforehand um, trying to prep for the class, and he shared that a class topic had been talking through the spaces that books would have been in and discussed during the Enlightenment period in England. Um, so with this in mind, along with Chris, our colleague Allison in Special Collections, and Jocelyn in the Print Drawing Study Room, we transformed the reading room and our neighbor, the Print Drawing Study Room, into eight imagined libraries that the students could visit. Um, I'm happy talking about this in depth. It was a really fun day, um, but you can kind of see a snippet here of how we had set up. Um, each imagined library um, kind of had a theme that we grouped books around. And th throughout this session, students were asked to think about these original contexts, which ranged from um, a Royal Science Society library to an imagined bookshop. Um, they were asked to think about the book market that these books would have been purchased in, um, the kind of circles of readers that they would have navigated, and the actual spaces themselves where they could have been read, and how they could have come into this collection um, and to Grinnell. Of the 50 books that we pulled for this imagined libraries tour, over half came from the Salisbury House collection. It was through preparing for this class that it really became clear that there is a collecting wealth in Enlightenment era materials um, from this collection. And my time with Lee Hunt and the Brewer collection uh, helped prepare me for that class for sure. Preparing to assist classes has really been a great experience to get to know this collection um, and to learn from students um, who are making discoveries every time they look at one of these books. Um, which is pretty exciting to be a part of. And for some of these books, Grinnell students are the first scholars that has paged through them for potentially centuries. A cornerstone of this collection and a benefit of being within an hour's drive of its original home um, is ongoing collaboration with Salisbury House. As Chris mentioned, at the time of the acquisition, a display case was installed in the Salisbury House Library, and we established a rotating loan with materials from the collection going back to visit the library. The 11th loan um, that we've done so far is on display right now through the end of December at Salisbury House, and it is Well at World's End, a Kelmscott Press book. We continue to collaborate with Salisbury House through library pop-ups at events as well, such as last year's garden party, which is pictured on this slide. 
This spring, the Salisbury uh, House will also host a book talk um, that we'll be giving about the collection and more details to come on that soon. Um, but many thanks to Keisha, Taylor, and Jamie, who have been excellent partners and peers to facilitate this ongoing collaboration. Interpretation has also been a large part of these early years of the collection at Grinnell. Prior to my arrival in August of 2020, the library purchased a magic box display case, um, which you can see pictured here with the leaves of grass text. Um, so the magic box lives in Burling Library Lobby, which is just upstairs from Special Collections. It's an interactive display case with a touch screen on the face. So visitors can use multimedia, um, go on uh, the um, websites that we link to it, and they can see more than just the selected page on display in the box. Previous installations have included a special editions um, of Ulysses by James Joyce. Um, we've also had in a 1672 book about the Order of the Garter um, and Les Fleurs Anime, which is a beautiful set in the collection and a student favorite um, of 1847 caricatured flowers. On display now are three editions of Leaves of Grass um, and coming soon in January 2023, will be a display on D.H. Lawrence material in the collection. Along with static elements that stay on the magic box, each installation um, features information about the materials and a digital site. I've mostly been using Adobe Spark for that. Um, the inaugural gallery exhibit of the collection was installed in fall of 2021. And you can see the poster there for the Book Fool. Book Fool, reading a bibliophile's library. Um, the digital exhibit remains available online, um, and I can link it out in the chat later as well, if anybody's interested. So the digital components from the Magic Box and any of our future exhibits um, will remain accessible online as a resource and also as accessibility. Campus response and social distancing throughout the last few years have greatly impacted our ability to host events. Um, but this last spring, we did host an open house with the um, collection, and this fall, another. We are very excited to be doing more in the future, um, so stay tuned for those as well. Um, we are looking for forward to hosting more and hope that you can visit soon to see the collection. Uh, a last chapter of the story so far that I want to touch on is collection care and conservation. Um, this is an exciting new chapter for us after a long and arduous search for a book conservator based in the Midwest. Um, we are pleased to be working with Noah Smoots of NS Conservation, a private practice based in St. Louis. Noah visited Grinnell last week for an introduction to the collection, getting to know the conservation needs and provide assessments for over 20 of our kind of top priority items um, that need some assistance. While, uh, while visiting, Noah met with library staff and students to kind of walk through what his work in conservation looks like and what he was seeing already from the Salisbury collection. Um, the first items to depart for conservation uh, I have listed on the screen are the collections Newton's Optics, um, which is a first edition, an 1890s special edition Morta Arthur, um, which was bound by um, Beardsley and has a really beautiful hand-painted design on vellum, a privately printed Lady Shatterley's Lover from 1928, and a Black Sun Press edition of Alice in Wonderland. Um, so we're very excited for this first step towards meeting conservation needs with the collection and supporting the collection um, for years to come. The book that you see here Noah working with is our Newton's Optics. Um, there has been a lot of damage to the spine. Um, you can see that it's really kind of broken down to choirs. Um, and just by him being able to look at this in his past experience um, working with another collection, he believes that our copy of Newton's Optics was possibly in a room that saw a fire because of the degree of leather condition along the spine and that kind of char that you're seeing. Um, so we're really excited to learn more about the provenance of these items that might be uncovered during conservation. 
Um, as Margaret mentioned in my introduction, um, this year I've picked up some academic librarian duties to help cover for research leave in the library. So my term has been extended through next school year. I'm really looking forward to spending another year focusing on this collection, and I feel fortunate to be at least a small footnote on the continued provenance of the Salisbury House Library Collection. Um, and I may be a little biased, but now for the fun part, seeing some items, um, photos, and our remaining time tonight does not do these items justice, but Chris and I would like to introduce you to some of the jewels of the collection and hope that you can come see more soon. Um, so I'll actually get us started. Um, what we're seeing here are our three books of hours in the collection. Um, all are pretty sumptuously decorated um, with gold leaf and decoration, rubrication throughout. Um, we do have a site, which I will drop in the chat uh, when I'm done talking as well, um, where you can kind of see some more pictures inside and the information that we know so far about these. Um, part of what comes with a historical collection of this time period um, is we really don't know much about identifying these beyond how they were sold in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, so through that material, all three of our books have been identified as 14th or 15th century and French origin. Um, we would really love to work with researchers that have more experience um, dating materials like this so that we can learn more about them. So if that's you in our audience, drop us an email. Um, but it's really been wonderful to have this material. Um, we did not have anything beyond leaves of Books of Hours previously in the collection. And so to have three um, full books, although they are a little bit out of order, um, is really wonderful to be able to bring into the classroom and um, introduce students to medieval manuscripts. Okay, uh, so I want to introduce to you a document signed by Queen Elizabeth I. Um, this is an early Elizabeth Elizabethan document, um, which includes an original wax seal. Um, Elizabeth was born in 1533 and passed in 1603 and ruled from 1558 until her death. Uh, the document itself is dated 1565. When it's folded, it measures at about eight inches, eight and three quarters inches, pardon me, by about five and seven eighths. And the seal is approximately four and three quarters inches across. Um, when it's unfolded, as you as you can see there, it's about 11 and a half by 25 and three quarters inches. Um, there are 39 lines. It is written in a variation of English secretary hand. And the documentation that came with this document um, speculates that it may have been written by an Irish scribe before it was carried to England where the last line, which is the, the date line, and the Queen's signature were added. And one side of the seal um, you'll see there is it portrays Queen Elizabeth on her throne. And on the other side, she's mounted on a horse. Great. Um, and then uh, seeing another manuscript on your screen now, um, this is a 1620 second part of Don Quixote um, printed in London. And so this is the first year that this little known second part of Don Quixote um, was printed in English. Um, so the text block itself uh, is in really interesting condition. Um, and I say interesting, hedging my bet. Uh, it is um, very loosely bound. Our assumption previously before Noah's visit was that it had never been bound um, or in a more permanent wrapper. Um, Noah, just taking a look at it very quickly, um, thought that it probably has been um, and then was unbound to get into the state it's currently in. Um, so this is a really interesting book as object that I love to pull for classes. 
the manuscript that you're seeing here is what's folded up and acting as the cover for the book text itself. Um, the manuscript is yet to be dated. Um, I should remember more from my uh, calligraphy class what the probable dates are for this text, um, but we're assuming that it is much older than the 1620 volume um, that it is wrapped around. Um, there are at the back here, um, the end pages of the book have been used as scrap paper for quite some time. Most of these are signatures dated to the 1770s. Um, and with the number of different names, one possibility we've thought of is it was potentially a school book that had access to so many young men practicing their signatures. Um, so this is just one of my favorite items to pull. Um, this is a contender for future conservation where we would uh, for sure preserve all of this material, um, but just get it supported so that it can uh, continue to be a teaching material for years to come. One of my other favorite objects in our collection now is this Count Scott Chaucer. Um, the Count Scott Press was founded by William Morris in May of 1891. Uh, the arts and crafts movement at that time was still very young in England, and Morris had had a, a strong interest in book design and, um, and a strong dissatisfaction with the quality of mass-produced paper and books at the time. Um, Kelmscott's products were all based on an idealized or romanticized notion of what manuscripts and early books looked like during the early modern period. Um, so you definitely see hallmarks of, of each of those types of um, media, but uh, again, it, it's a kind of romanticized notion. Uh, Kelmscott Chaucer was published in 1896. Ours, this copy here, uh, is bound in al alum tawed pigskin. It does have uh, clasps on the four edges. The decoration is blind tooled, so uh, there's there's no gold leaf incorporated into the decoration. Um, the binding was designed by William Morris, who was the founder of the Kelmscott Press, but, but was executed by uh, an employee of the Dove's Bindery. The woodcuts were designed by Edward Byrne Jones, and uh, in the William S. and Sylvia Holton Peterson census of 2011, uh, they record 45 extant copies uh, bound by the Dove's Bindery. Um, but not too many years later, the Northeast Document Conservation Center estimated that there, there are approximately 50 total copies. So um, really not many. And uh, this, this book was the final finished product of Morris's before his passing later in 1896. So it's just really the arts and crafts period is 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 an area that I'm really interested in and this is it's just such a beautiful example of of um, really I would argue personally the sort of the pinnacle of of um, Kelmscott production great um and then a last um jewel of the collection to look at tonight um this was pulled for the class that I mentioned that was looking at Enlightenment era books and the spaces in which they were advertised um, and then used. Um, so this is Ackerman's Repository of Arts, Literature, Commerce, Manufacturer, Fashions, and Politics. Um, this magazine was created between 1810 and 1813. We have a number of volumes, but not a full run. I find these really fascinating because it's such a mix of different material. Um, in some of the volumes, you'll find meteorological reports, um, reports of new inventions and furniture designs. Um, there are beautiful fashion plates that you can see on the right here um, that have been uh, hand colored. Um, and then part of what I find so fascinating about them are fabric samples. There are also some samples of wallpaper um, inserted in these editions. Um, but it's just such an interesting book for materiality. 
um, and for to think about this time period and the new markets that were being introduced, um, that this is one of my favorites to pull for classes um, because it's just such a unique thing to find on the shelf. Um, so with one last nod to uh, the Lee Hunt era, um, we'll move on from there. Um, so we'd like to close tonight with an eye to the chapters left to be written for this collection. Uh, upcoming priorities with the collection are digitization. We acquired a book scanner in the past year from book to net that is primed to work with rare books material. Um, so we will be moving in 2023 to digitization being a priority for the collection. Um, and first up for that will be a unique material, including the medieval manuscripts, um, correspondence of the artist Joseph Stella, and an ongoing project focusing on digitizing the 12 incunabula in the collection um, and building a digital platform for that. We will also be looking into um, and moving forward with updating censuses and databases um, that the Salisbury collection was already on. Um, some of them are new lists um, that we would be able to contribute to. So the Incunabula short title database, um, there are 10 of our 12 Incunabula already on the site. Um, we can add two more to the listings um, and as well as contributing to the material evidence index that accompanies that site. We will be updating Kelmscott and Shakespeare censuses, um, and we're hoping to look at fragmentology studies, um, particularly with an eggy portfolio that we have in the collection um, and possibly identifying other fragments as well. Um, but we're very excited about this for future exposure to the collection, to be able to connect with scholars that don't know that this material exists or that it is now accessible here at Grinnell. We're also very look, much looking forward to continuing research with the collection, especially with linking it further to the existing rare book collection at Grinnell. Um, also exploring research interests on campus, particularly in the extra illustrated editions in the um, on the shelves, looking into materiality and interdisciplinary interests, um, as well as looking into the collection itself, um, how it was collected over time, Carl Weeks' correspondence with booksellers and the book market. Um, and my personal interest is looking at him in conversation with other bibliophiles in Iowa um, of the era. We're also very much looking forward to continuing exhibits and events with the collection, um, bringing them out of the magic box and uh, into the community, into um, the metaverse, um, and uh, looking forward to more gallery exhibits coming soon with the collection. Um, and we're also looking at supporting our scholarship um, here at Grinnell to be able to promote this collection and support Grinnell scholars and visitors um, from beyond campus. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight and we look forward to your help writing the next chapters. And um, I will also promote our website. I will drop this in the chat, um, but you can find out more about upcoming events, how to visit and see the collection on our collection website. Um, and we look forward to seeing you here at Grinnell soon. So thank you, everyone. Uh, here is our, our contact information. Um, our drop-in hours, we're open 1.30 to 5, Monday through Friday, and are happy to, uh, happy to take appointments in the mornings because, frankly, that'll likely get us out of uh, previously scheduled meetings. Um, so help us out. Um, we are located in the lower level of Berlin Library on 6th Avenue in Grinnell. Thank you all very much.